Kevin, you want this? I can click and do the other thing too. Yes, sir. Good evening. If you have your Bible with you, would you take it out, please, and turn to 1 Peter? 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be here in just a second. That'll kind of provide the jumping off point for our lesson tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read in verses 8 and 9 here in just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Uh, as we continue with our theme of better together. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard the phrase, don't judge a man until you walk a mile in his shoes. Raise your hand if you've heard that. Okay, just about everybody. Good, we're on the same page. Uh, when I was a teenager, um, you know, parents can be embarrassing when you're a teenager. Um, and uh, my dad used to always say, don't judge a man until you walk a mile in his moccasins. And I was like, Dad, like, come on, like, what are you doing? That's weird. Like, like just say it like everybody else say it, says it, you know, don't walk a mile. Uh, don't judge a man until you walk a mile in his shoes. And that phrase uh, actually originated with a poem t entitled Judge Softly, written in 1895. That's 1895 by a lady named Mary Lathrop. And it wasn't shoes that we were supposed to walk in in this poem, but moccasins. Now keep in mind, this was written in 1895, so some of the language and ideas might be a little different than what we're used to, but I'm going to read this poem at the beginning of the lesson tonight, and then we're going to talk about what the Bible says about this same topic. Pray. Don't find fault with the man that limps or stumbles along the road, unless you've worn the moccasins he wears or stumbled beneath the same load. There may be tears in his souls that hurt, though hidden away from view. The burden he bears placed on your back may cause you to stumble and fall too. Don't sneer at the man who is down today unless you have felt the same blow that caused his fall or felt the shame that only the fallen know. You may be strong, but still the blows that were his, unknown to you in the same way, may cause you to stagger and fall too. Don't be too harsh with the man that sins or pelt him with words or stones or disdain unless you are sure you have no sins of your own and it's only wisdom and love that your heart contains. For you know if the tempter's voice should whisper as soft to you as it did to him when he went astray, it might cause you to falter too. Just walk a mile in his moccasins before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. If just for one hour you could find a way to see through his eyes instead of your own muse. I believe you'd be surprised to see that you've been blind and narrow-minded, even unkind. There are so many people on reservations and in the ghettos who have so little hope and too much worry on their minds. Brother... There but for the grace of God go you and I, just for a moment, slip into his mind and traditions and see the world through his spirit and eyes before you cast a stone or judge falsely his conditions. Remember to walk a mile in his moccasins and remember the lessons of humanity taught you by your elders. We will be known forever by the tracks we leave in other people's lives our kindness and generosity. Take the time to walk a mile in his moccasins. What this poem calls for is the need for us to show empathy toward our fellow man, to not just feel bad for him because of the things he's going through, but to strive to understand him, to feel what he feels and take action from that place of understanding. And of course, this is a biblical concept as well. Though the word where we get sympathy is used instead of the English word empathy. Which brings us to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. I want us to see if you're reading from the, the English Standard Version. Who's reading English Standard Version? So you're reading from that version. It actually says sympathy. I'm reading from the New King James and it's going to say compassion for one another. Let's read in verse 8. Finally, all of you, who does that apply to? Ha. All of you be of one mind, 
the brethren, one mind, better together, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, have brotherly love, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you might inherit a blessing. And then he quotes from the book of Psalms to describe what that blessing might be like in our lives. If we want to know God, if we want to see good days, if we want to have God hear our prayers and have his face for us rather than against us, this is the kind of character that we need to have. We need to have, among other things, compassion or sympathy or empathy for one another. The Greek word that is used there is sympathes or sympathies. And we have the Greek word pathos, pathos, uh, we often say, and the Greek word sum, uh, sim in English. So pathos is the idea for feeling or emotion, and sum or sim is the idea of the same. And so you have the same feeling or emotion as somebody else when you feel this for them. You feel what they feel at the same time. Now in English, those two words, sympathy and empathy, uh, they have formal and informal definitions in, in several different contexts. But let me just simplify it to define terms uh, for the lesson tonight. Sympathy is when you feel bad for somebody. You take pity on them. You see them and you think, oh, that's terrible. I hate that for them. But empathy is feeling, or at least you imagine feeling, what they are feeling. You're trying to put yourself in their shoes. You're imagining walking a mile in their moccasins. And that concept of empathy is used throughout the New Testament. Now, 1 Peter 3 is the only place where this particular Greek word, sympathes, is used but its root is used in several other places. And perhaps our best example of this concept comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn there if you would with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's start reading in verse 21. The New Testament uses a several different metaphors to describe the church. Um, it's, it's a building in some places, it's um, associated with the kingdom in other places. Here the church is described as a body. Uh, and we're going to pick up in, the, in kind of the middle of this reading. Uh, let's read there in verse 20, beginning. But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. They have a necessary function. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism. No division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Now, notice, let's read very carefully verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. So the image that he gives is of a body, and this body, is, um, this body is composed up of a lot of members. And in the midst of that, he says, if one member suffers, then all the members suffer with it. Suffer with is that idea, that, that idea of sympathy or empathy. We feel what they feel. We share in their emotion. We share in their experience. Even if we don't experience it specifically ourselves. And that makes sense even when we think about the body, right? Uh, Stephanie and I, I think I've mentioned this already, for many years now we've been going up to Tennessee in the summer uh, to work a Florida college summer camp up there. Uh, and there's a guy at camp, he seems like uh, he's younger than me. Uh, I hate to admit this, he's probably more athletic than me. Uh, 
but, but he's one of these guys, he's just always getting hurt. Like every year he's getting hurt in one way or another. And um, so one year he's playing with the kids and we're playing uh, pin dodge. And so that's a combination of like bowling and dodgeball. Don't worry, the balls are not bowling balls. Um, and so he's playing with the kids and playing indoors in this kind of gymnasium sort of area. And, and he cuts and his shoe kind of gives out on him. And on his big toe, he ripped the toenail totally off. Yeah, that was, ugh, that's my reaction to that too. And so he's bleeding through his shoe and his sock. And so he runs out and uh, into the foyer area. And I'm out there and I'm like, dude, what's wrong? What's wrong? He's like, oh, I hurt my foot. I hurt my foot. Um, and he takes off his shoe and he takes off his sock. Um, and he throws up. And that's kind of his reaction whenever he gets hurt. So, I mean, this has happened multiple times, multiple injuries, okay? I know this is kind of gross. Stick with me for just a second. I looked at him, and he's sweating profusely. He is pale as a ghost. And I already said what he did, right? Was there something wrong with his skin on his face? Was he too hot? Was that why he was sweating? Was there something wrong with his stomach? Did he have a stomach virus? The only thing that was wrong with him was his big toe, right? And yet when that one member suffered, the other members of his body were reacting to that suffering. They were feeling what the toe felt. Well, that's exactly the image that, that the Apostle Paul is trying to give us in 1 Corinthians, right? When one member suffers, yeah, it's not me that's suffering, but I don't say, oh, good thing it wasn't me, you know? Like the stomach is not, well, tough luck, toe. I'm sorry you're suffering, but I'm glad I'm not. No, we all suffer with. We, we have that same feeling and emotion. And when one is honored, we all rejoice in that. And we've talked about some of those things already this week. But I think it's helpful for us to think about it in these terms. Let's turn now to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says that in order for me to be pleasing to God, I must, be, I must become good at trading places with other people, feeling what they're feeling. Remember what he says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. You know, lots of people in the world know this concept. Uh, we call it the golden rule, right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You imagine what you would want done to you, how you would feel in this situation, and you try and do the same thing to somebody else. Now notice Jesus doesn't say, what would I like to do to them? He doesn't say, what do I think they deserve? It says... What would I want if I were in the same situation as them? All right, I've, I've asked you to raise your hands about a few different things. Let me ask you to raise... Who in here has ever rear-ended someone in a car? Anybody? You were willing to admit it? I did that in college. You didn't remember? Yeah, well, when you do it enough times and you're the insurance guy, I guess, you know. I did that in college. I rear-ended somebody... Um, it's kind of my buddy's fault sitting in the seat next to me. He was trying to distract me. He had his finger up his nose or something, you know. And, and I rear-ended the person in front of me, and I just, I felt horrible about that. I felt horrible about that. And, and what this passage is saying is the way I felt that feeling there when somebody rear-ends me, and that happened a couple of years ago in San Antonio. Somebody rear-ends me. When I get out of the car, when someone's rear-ended me, I need to remember that feeling that I had when, some, when I rear-ended somebody else and try and treat them the way I wanted to be treated in that situation. How did I want to be treated? Did I want to be chewed out? Did I want somebody to get in my face? Did I want somebody to be super mad at me? Or did I want somebody to be understanding? and compassionate and reasonable. And so what am I called to be? Understanding and compassionate and reasonable when I get out of the car because somebody rear-ended me. That's tough, isn't it? You know, there are some things in Christianity that are tough. We are called to have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. 
We've quoted this verse already this week, Romans 12 and verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It does not say show pity on those who are going through rough times. It doesn't say feel bad for other people. It says when they cry, you cry. When they're happy, you be happy. It is a direct transfer of emotions. I feel what they feel. And you'll notice that these are not commands about the things that we should be doing for other people. It doesn't say that you're supposed to go out and do this. Instead, they are simply commands of feeling the same way our brethren feel. Now, does that cause us to do things for our brethren? Of course. But it's a matter of motivation. And if we do things for our brethren because we try and feel the same way they feel, it is coming from a different, much more powerful place than, you know, I feel bad for them. I think I'll do something for them. Um, let's look in uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Just trying to establish this, this concept uh, from a biblical perspective and then we'll make some application. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 13. Remember the prisoners. Uh, remember the Christians who are in prison. You should feel really bad for them, the Hebrew writer says. You know, pity them. No, what does he say? Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Again, the idea is of the body, the church. And he says, they're members and you're members as well. And so you don't just take pity on those Christians who've been thrown into prison. You think about them and you remember them and you pray for them as if you were the one in chains yourself. What actions would you want to be taken if you were the one in prison instead of them? It doesn't say take a meal to them. Well, that'd be awesome. That'd be needed. But it says remember them as though you were there with them. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't take a meal to them. We should. But if we do a good work for a brother and sister of, in Christ, we often think that we have absolved ourselves of our duty toward them. And this passage tells us otherwise. Feeling what they feel, imagining myself in their place, it expands my responsibility and my compassion toward them. For example, um, I have a sister in Christ whose spouse recently passed away. And what did Stephanie and I do when that happened? Well, we sent her flowers, we wrote a card. Uh, we didn't just go to the, the funeral. I preached the funeral. I, I spent a lot of time preparing that. I, I let her know that we're praying for her, and then, and then we did. We prayed for her. Now, are those all good things? Can I hear your head rattle this way, that way? Yeah, those are all good things, right? But all of those things can happen within the span of a week. And they're all good, impactful, important things that we should do. But if we truly place ourselves in the place of our sister, we put ourselves in her situation, then I think we will realize that our, our obligation is much more to her than just these things. Uh, our obligation to her extends even after she's off the prayer list, and she's been off the prayer list for a while. What would it be like? What would it be like to lose my spouse? Even if they were a faithful Christian as her husband was, what would that be like? What would that feel like? And as I lay down imagining going to bed alone, I realized that there were many days ahead of her, and there were probably some days where she was going to feel fine, but maybe the nights were going to get really, really lonely. Maybe we think to ourselves as we go out with couples and, and things are so easy and natural in that environment, we imagine, we imagine someone feeling isolated from their brethren, even dear friends whose spouses are still living. We may realize that it gets better as the months go on, but there are still going to be times when it's really hard. 
And I imagine it may seem like everybody else has forgotten about my spouse and won't talk about them anymore around me thinking it's going to hurt me, but I want to remember them in that situation. And you'll notice that there are no actions listed in these realizations about our, our sister. But hopefully you can see that these are, are two ways of dealing with a problem. Sympathy says, I feel bad, so what's my duty or obligation to fulfill? Empathy says, what are they feeling and what would I want the response to be to that? Now, don't get me wrong. Sympathy, feeling bad for somebody, don't feel guilty about that. It's not a bad thing. But empathy, feeling what they feel, is even better. And I think we can see that this perspective of empathy drives us to deeper connection and fellowship with our brethren. We can't just check a box and then move on in our mind because we've finished what it is we're supposed to do. If we take on the mind of our brother or sister, then we may realize how much longer we need to be working in their lives and how much deeper our care and concern should be. Jesus is, of course, the ultimate example of feeling what someone else feels. Though we are made in His image, He is in, in so many ways different than us, isn't He? We think about Jesus. What is He that we are not? Well, He is sovereign. He is holy. He is perfect. He is all present and powerful and knowing. And yet, how is Jesus described in Hebrews chapter 4? Turn back a few pages from Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, now, what is that talking about? Is that saying God's looking down and says, I feel bad for them? Well, God does that, right? God takes pity on us. He has mercy on us. But Jesus is doing something far more than that. He sympathizes with our weaknesses because He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ is able to sympathize. That's another version of the Greek word. This one's sympathio. He's sympathizing with our weaknesses because he literally put himself in our shoes. There's literally again. He felt temptation. He felt loss and pain and death and sorrow, and joy, and gladness, and fatigue, and betrayal, and frustration. Jesus felt it. He felt what we feel. And if you go back to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, that was what was required of Him to be the sacrifice that He was. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, it's the same opening in my Bible. It says, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself also suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And we see examples of this throughout the Gospels, don't we? We see examples of Jesus expressing his emotion, and he expresses those emotions powerfully. And so often what we see in the Gospels is Jesus' emotions are mirroring, mirroring the people that He's with. He's feeling what they feel. Uh, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Anybody know it? Jesus wept, right? John chapter 11 and verse 35. Jesus did not immediately do something for Mary and Martha. I mean, He was going to raise their brother from the dead. That's doing something really big for them, right? But what's the thing that he did before he did anything? He wept. Why was he weeping? Lazarus was about to be raised from the dead. I mean, I'm, I'm asking, why? Why would Jesus weep when he knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead? Why? You know what? I want a response. Why was he weeping? Because he feels for them. Because they were weeping, he was weeping. He empathized. 
And though, and this is always the case with God, though He could see so much more, though He knew their pain was going to be temporary, He looked at them and He saw their pain and He felt it with them. He wept with them. And this concept is vital for us as Christians. If we're going to be better together, we have to learn to show biblical empathy. It's vital for lots of reasons, but I want to focus in on, by way of application, three things that we will better accomplish if we show biblical empathy toward others. With empathy, we will first of all develop more patience and long-suffering with the weak. Patience with my brethren who have sinned. Patience with my brethren who annoy me. Well, maybe you don't have any brethren who annoy you. I've got a... Maybe I annoy others. Maybe that's what it is. I have to have... I have to have patience with my brethren who treat me poorly, all those sorts of things. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that's what we're instructed to have and show. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil to evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. I'm afraid sometimes we as Christians, um, we want the weak among us to get strong, and that's a good motivation, but we want them to get strong overnight. You know, why, why aren't you strong? You've been a Christian three days. You ought to be strong by now. The babes in Christ, we want them to grow to maturity yesterday. And for everyone to be as they ought to be with no mistakes along the way. But... My dad always says, misquoting Jesus, he says, the weak you will have with you always. And we need to be patient with them. Because maybe, without realizing it, I'm one of those weak ones that people need to be patient with. Feeling what they feel helps us to have patience with them because we would want that same kind of patience shown with us. Why are they acting this way? What has happened in their life? How would I feel if those things happened to me? You know, I think uh, teachers and educators experience this sort of thing all the time. Do we have any educators in the audience? Um, I came from a, from a family of educators. My mom uh, is and was a teacher. My dad was a teacher and coach and then principal and superintendent. Uh, and teachers, you experience this sort of things with students. Um, I know I did in the short time I was in the classroom. Maybe you've got that really, really troubled student, you know, that student who's just bad in class, not doing their work, and all those sorts of things. And the temptation is, the temptation is to get put out with that sort of student. Your problem child, and that's manifested in any number of ways, and, and you just want to wring their little neck. You know, it's true. And your attitude might be, well, the Bible says I have to love them, and I'm a Christian, so I'm going to love them. But I don't have to like them. Then over the course of your time together, you find out some things about that student. You find out perhaps that he was adopted from a horrible situation, or she has a special needs sibling, or his parents probably have an issue with prescription medication, and they definitely have problem with discipline and attention paid to this child and his or her siblings. And this child perhaps has to be the de facto parent most of the time. And the reason why they're late to your class is because they were getting the siblings ready and they were fixing breakfast. And what happens when you find out those things as an educator? I mean, your heart, your heart just melts for them. What do we do with that information? Now, sympathy would just make us feel bad about this, cause us to pity the child. But empathy would cause us to think about our own upbringing. And imagine if we were in that situation. If we had to deal with all of that at their age, how well would we be doing and how well would we want other people to treat us? And maybe even more powerfully, for those of you who are parents in that situation, if I died and my children went to live with this child's parents, how would I want the teacher to treat my children? My dad had something that he said all the time he was an administrator. Our duty as educators is to treat every child as if he or she were our own. That's empathy, isn't it? And all of a sudden we realize that maybe that child's doing pretty well, all things considered. 
And the way we treat them changes. Your desire for them to succeed increases. Your intention to their needs is sharpened. And your love for them becomes a sacrificial, selfless love seeking to serve and uplift them rather than just a, a begrudging obligation or fulfillment of duty. Well, I'm talking about kids at school, but I'm not really. Not just talking about that. I'm talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ, too. And I'm talking about the lost, too. You know, there's lots of sins that I don't understand. Uh, There are sins where people are committing these sins, and I think to myself, I have no zero temptation to do that. And yet it is also true that I commit sins, that there are others, they look at me and say, "I I have zero temptation to do that. You know... One of the ways that I know that is with the guy I talked about a few nights ago that I called and said, you know, what's up, what's wrong? His particular temptation is not something that I struggle with, and yet I've revealed some temptations to him. He's like, really? Really? You struggle with that? Really? In love. And yet, even though I don't have the same temptation, I have temptation. And I want you to be patient with me. So I want to be patient with you. This is not winking at sin. This is not ignoring sin. But it is acknowledging that my brother or sister in Christ is genuinely trying to overcome sin. And I need to do everything within my power to help them and uphold them and be there for them. To comfort the faint-hearted, to uphold the weak and to be patient with all in these situations. Yes, from time to time, I need to warn those who are unruly. But even that comes after I have put myself in their shoes. They need my help, not my judgmental condemnation from afar. You remember in John chapter 8 and verse 7 when Jesus was brought, that woman caught in adultery? Jesus doesn't try and make them sympathize. He doesn't try and make them feel bad for this woman. What does he do? Well, first he gets down, I don't know why, I wish I would know what it was he was writing on the ground. But he gets down and he writes on the ground, and then he says what? Do you remember? He who is without sin casts the first stone. You know what he's trying to do there? He's trying to get them to show empathy. He's trying to get them to think about their own sins. Jesus made them feel what she felt, the burden and shame of sin. And the exact opposite is found in in Luke chapter 18. Remember where there is this, this tax collector and this Pharisee who go to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, he, he looks up into heaven and he says, God, I thank you that I'm so awesome. I thank you that I am not like other men are. And he gives a long list and he says, or even as this tax collector. That's the exact opposite attitude. He couldn't put himself in the shoes of a sinner because his self-righteousness was so great, he couldn't imagine the idea that somehow he's done something to offend his God. And yet who does Jesus say went home justified? The one who had humility enough to see and acknowledge his own sin. The fact of the matter is, I am like other men. Maybe not exactly, maybe not in the same way, But I too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have. And so that should lead us to have patience and long-suffering with the weak. With empathy, we will also develop more long-term consistency in prayer and service toward others. That's one of my personal aggravations as a Christian. You know, it waxes and wanes sometimes. My consistency in, in serving other people and praying for other people like I should. I go through periods where that's really, really good and really, really strong. And then others times when it's not. And I think one of the things that has helped me the most is trying to put myself in the shoes of my brethren. And if I go back to that over and over and over again, then I keep doing the things that I ought to be doing. Again, if I just feel sorry for someone and do something to fulfill my duty, that's quickly fulfilled. But empathy requires something more lasting. And this should be shown toward Christians and non-Christians. Let me give you some, some very practical examples of this. What about with our spouses? Have you ever thought, what's wrong with them? Have you ever thought that? Stephanie's not here, so I can just say all kinds of things, right? She's perfect. That's, that's what I'm supposed to say, right? No, she... 
She's not. Pretty close, but she's not. And there have been times where I've thought, what's wrong with her? What's going on right now? Instead of, why does she feel this way? I need this, I've thought to myself as a spouse. Instead of, what is it that they need? And we can get awfully selfish in marriages sometimes. My shoes are the only ones that matter, and I'm not even going to consider yours. They feel that way, whether you like it or not, so you need to try and understand why they feel that way. You need to show that empathy toward them. Strive to understand. We are commanded as husbands... We're commanded that, to dwell with your wives with understanding, in an understanding way. You don't have to understand all women, men, but you need to understand your spouse. You need to understand that she does feel that way and treat her accordingly because you have empathy toward her. Tim Keller in his great little book on marriage says, If each spouse says to the other, I will treat my selfishness as the main problem in the marriage you have the prospect for great things. Show empathy within your marriages, and your marriages are going to improve. What about with those who are excluded from the group? Um, and I include in those, even those who have isolated themselves, even if it was their own sin, perhaps, that caused that isolation. How would I feel to lose what I thought was a lasting friendship? What would it be like to see others get along and have fun, but I'm left out? How would I respond to that? Raise your hand if you've ever been left out of a group anytime. Uh, well, bless you if you didn't raise your hand, but almost all of us can raise our hand to that. I want you to take just 10 seconds. I want you to call that memory to mind. How did it feel to be left out when you knew you were left out? kind of mad just thinking about it. And I would never want to make somebody else feel that way. Now, am I saying that there aren't some people that you gravitate to more than others, that there are other people who are in the same stage of life as you and all those sorts of things? Of course, all of those things are true. But we should never, ever intentionally exclude someone in this way. Include all that you can. Go out of your way to include others, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. What about other marriages that have problems? You know, I come home to a wife that loves me and a home that is filled with conversation and laughter and mutual respect. I'm excited. As much as I love all y'all, I love being here, I'm excited about getting to go home and be with Stephanie and the girls. And yes, there is the occasional argument or moments of selfishness or coldness that take place. But generally, it is a place of joy. But what if it wasn't? What would I need? How much support would I need in those moments? What if instead of having a spouse that was beside me, pulling in the same direction toward heaven, what if I had a spouse that was pulling in the opposite direction? And I was the only one who was trying to do what was right in that relationship. What kind of help and support might I need if that's the way I felt, if that's what I was going through? What about when we look at parents who struggle with their kids? You know, sometimes we can be judgmental about that. But what if I were struggling in that same way? How frustrating would it be? How embarrassing might it be? What kind of grace would I want shown toward me in that situation? What about those who are going through a, a loss or a divorce or a financial hardship? When does the pain go away after a divorce? In a week, in a month, in a year? Have I checked on them lately if they're going through that? Have I been long-suffering toward their grief and their emotion? What about those in the nursing home? What about those who are homebound or recovering from some sort of illness? What would it be like? To be up there all alone, all day, and not seeing anybody except the occasional nurse. What would I want others to do in that situation? What about those who are physically sick with long-term illnesses? They get up every morning and it hurts everywhere. I, I don't have very many days like that. But what if I did? To constantly be sick to your stomach or to have a headache every single day, to have the aches and chills... What is that like? How does it feel? 
How beaten down would I get over the course of time? You know, Stephanie jokes and says a few days of the man cold wears me out, you know. I mean, well, what would it be like if I were constantly sick? How would I feel? I want you to think about all of those situations. And then, after you say, how would I feel, that's when you act. And that will affect my prayers. I will remember them in prayer. I will pray fervently for answers, for deliverance, for healing. That will affect my actions. What can I do to help today, this week, instead of, you know, I've already done a lot to help them already. That will affect my attitude. As the poem said, there but for the grace of God go I. Instead of, I thank God that I'm not like other men or how long is this going to continue? And I don't know all of those specific situations in this congregation. I use those as examples because they're common. Because I've seen them. Some I've experienced myself. But if I understand correctly, you have a... uh, an email that goes out maybe every Monday or so called Prayerfully Remember. Here's your assignment. When that goes out, or even better yet, tonight, I want you to open up the email. Did it go out on Monday? It went out on Monday, y'all. The one that went out on Monday, I want you to open it up, and I want you to go through this. And this isn't just for the adults. Um, You teenagers, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to go through and say, how would it feel if I were them? How would it feel if I were them? How would it feel if I were them? And then you'll know what to do. You'll know what small thing you can do in order to help those folks. And it's going to help our long-term consistency in prayer and service to others. And then finally, with empathy, we will develop more adaptability and urgency in evangelism. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would. This is our last passage tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians 9 and verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law. Not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, under the law of Christ, he says, that I might win those who are without law, without the law of Moses. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker of it, partaker of the good news with you. I want you to have the same good news that was shared with me, Paul says. And, And this is not Paul being disingenuous. This is Paul trying to make a connection with people. He says, these people need the gospel. And I was in that same situation. And so I'm going to try and make a connection with these people however I can, in whatever way that I can, because that's what I would have wanted someone to do with me. If I didn't have the gospel, if I didn't have a right relationship with Christ. And so we should ask ourselves, where can I find common ground with this person? Where can I make a connection? Because I would want that same attitude shown toward me. If I were in their shoes, for the gospel's sake, for Christ's sake, and for their sake, and for my sake, I'm willing to do it. And if I were in their shoes without the gospel, what would I want said to me? And when would I want it said? And how, with what attitude, and what tone would I want it said? With every person with whom we come into contact, we should show this kind of empathy. And it will inform our decision-making process greatly. Um, Do you remember the book, uh, well, there was a movie too, To Kill a Mockingbird, written by Harper Lee. Donald and I talked about this. Was that last night we were talking about this? Uh, We both love that book. Um, It's an awesome book if you've never read it. My youngest is just older than Scout, who is the little girl... Uh, in that book, just older than what she was for most of the book. 
And it is good advice that her father, Atticus, gives her. Listen to this. If you can learn a simple trick, Scout, you'll get along a lot better with all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside of his skin and walk around in it. That's impactful, but it's also biblical. And if I can be so bold tonight, I've really been holding back up to this point. This concept is even more powerful today than it used to be. Because we live in a world that refuses to show empathy. That has no desire to understand. That has no desire to forgive. That has no desire to see things from from their opponent, even their enemy's point of view. And you know what that provides for us as Christians? It provides us with an an incredible opportunity to show people the way Christians act because we treat other people the way we wish to be treated. Because we rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. It allows us the opportunity to stand out because we don't just feel bad for people. We try and walk a mile in their moccasins. And so if you're here tonight and you're not yet a Christian, I've been in your shoes. What would I want said to me? I'll tell you, there is no better decision that you can make. And where you are right now, and it breaks my heart, is without hope and without God. But that is not a feeling that you have to have anymore, ever again. Christ loved you so much, He came and died on a cross for you. Not with the assurance that you would come to Him, but in the hope that you would. It's the greatest gift that's ever been given. Please, please, won't you accept that gift of grace? By coming to Christ in humble repentance, by putting Christ on in baptism for the remission of your sins, your sins washed away, being forgiven, that you might rise to walk in newness of life. And if you're already a Christian tonight, what would I want to be said to me if I were in your shoes? Well, I don't know exactly what your shoes are, but this I do know, that no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. That there is some brother or sister in Christ, be it me or somebody else, who knows exactly what you're going through. And they've come through it. And they can help you come through it too. But they've got to know. So if there is something that you need to say or do, if you just need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, won't you come now while together we stand and while we sing.